Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming back for the keynote session. I am so excited to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Delegate Jennifer Carol Foy. She is an incredibly accomplished woman, so I am super excited to hear what she has to say. She was one of the first African American women to graduate from BMI. She was a foster mom, a magistrate judge, a public defender. And now she is running for governor here in Virginia. She embodies the ideals of community, honor, and commitment. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Delegate Carol Foy. Hi. Hi, everyone. It is such an honor and privilege to be here with you all um, for this timely and necessary conversation um, about women and women leading and what that looks like. And we have to be on the forefront. I'm just so excited to be here with you. So I am Delegate Jennifer Carol Foy, and I do represent Prince William and Stafford, and I am running for governor here in Virginia. And so when I think about women and women leadership, and I think about what's next for us, um, I always think think of how we're always told about those barriers and how it's an obligation for all of us um, to break down barriers and root out injustice wherever it lays, to blaze trails where none exist. And so many of you, like I know I have, been told no many times and been told what is and isn't possible. So I just want to take a second to talk to you all a little bit about the power of being told no. So I grew up in Petersburg, Virginia. Petersburg has one of the highest child poverty rates, rates of unaccredited schools, and was named one of the most dangerous places to live per capita in Virginia. And that's where I'm from. But luckily I was raised by my grandparents and especially my grandmother, Mary Lee, a Southern Christian woman who had me in church three days a week, who taught me the values and principles that I hold true today. And she told me that the price that I pay for my time here on earth is a service that I give to others. So if I have it, I have to give it. So I don't remember a time when we didn't have someone from the community or church who fell on hard times living with us. I thought that's what everyone did. So I'll never forget, at a young age, my grandmother having a stroke and becoming a quadriplegic and having to sit at my dining room table with my aunt, trying to decide if we're gonna pay for our mortgage that month or for the medications keeping my grandmother alive. And I knew then that something was wrong, that everyone is not equal, that I was a part of one of those communities that have been long ignored, neglected and left behind. And I made a promise then to make sure that no other little girl in Virginia has to make that type of impossible decision. And people said, well, what are you gonna do? Who do you know? You're just a poor girl from Petersburg. How are you really gonna make a difference? How are you going to make a change? But let me tell you about the power of no. That if a young poor girl from Petersburg can grow up to be the leading legislator to help expand Medicaid to over 460,000 Virginians, keeping her promise, then I tell you that anything is possible. And I was told no again when I decided to go to Virginia Military Institute. Being in high school, watching the Virginia Military Institute Supreme Court decision on TV. And I remember seeing and hearing that women were going and being enrolled and admitted. And it wasn't until that moment that I realized that I had been relegated to second class citizenship because there were colleges in this country that I couldn't attend simply because I was female. And I remember hearing the men in my class say things like, you know, well, women don't belong at Virginia Military Institute because we are born inferior. We cannot withstand the academic rigor and the military challenges that VMI had to offer. Because you see, VMI has one of the highest dropout rates of any institute of higher learning in this country, and that's by design. As Justice Ginsburg said, it is an extraordinary school meant for only extraordinary people. And I remember hearing the men say, well, women have a place in society and we need to stay in it, that we can't run as fast, push as hard, that we are just naturally inferior. 
but I also heard the words of Justice Ginsburg in her opinion when she said that women can do all things if given the opportunity, and I agreed. So after hearing her words and listening to her voice, I turned around and I looked at those men and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to VMI because I'm just as powerful and smart and capable as any man in this classroom. And of course, all the men jumped up and protested. And it was at that time that my best friend, he was gonna go to West Point and he walked up to me and he said, you know what, Jen, I'm gonna go with you when you go to VMI because I want to be there to watch you when you fail. Because although we're friends, don't forget, I'm still female and therefore to him and many other men, inferior. So I looked at him and said, challenge accepted. So I went to VMI, so did he and another male from our class. And when they got their head shaved bald, so did I. When they put on, on a man's uniform, they gave me a man's uniform. VMI changed none of their standards for women. And for years, I marched, sweat, and bled beside over a thousand male cadets, and they all knew my name. But I'm here to tell you that out of the other two men who went with me to VMI, that I am the only one of us to walk across that Virginia Military Institute stage. And that is the power of being told no. And lastly, in 2017, in 2017, I decided to run for the House of Delegates because I wanted to be a response to the xenophobic, homophobic, racist, and misogynistic rhetoric that was coming not only out of DC, but out of Richmond. And so I announced the last week of January, 2017, and my husband and I became pregnant, of course, on Valentine's Day, with not one, but two babies, because I don't do anything easy. And so people, who found out said, well, when are you dropping out of the race? And I said, well, why do I have to drop out? And they say, well, how are you gonna be a new mom, a wife, a public defender, and a candidate running for office, flipping a seat from red to blue while pregnant with twins when your opponent has outraged you four to one and have every major legislator's endorsement in your area? It just cannot be done. And so, I knew that I would be outraised, but I knew I would never be outworked. So I raised the money I could. I knocked the doors. I sent the po postcards. I made the phone calls. And while on bed rest, upside down, preparing to give birth to twins, I won my delegate race. And I won by 10 whole votes. And that carried me over to my next general election where I won by almost 20%. So I say that to say this, that as women, there will constantly be barriers and glass ceilings put on and around us. But we have to make a concerted effort to break down barriers and blaze trails where none exist, not only for us, but for the young girls that are coming behind us, because it is our job and obligation and our duty to do so. Constantly breaking down stereotypes constantly fighting against the establishment because everything is stacked on, upon us. We are the majority of caregivers of our parents and of our children. We're having to balance all, do it all while in hills and still make it look good and easy. But we were built for this. We were born for this. And now is our time. In the words of Supreme Court Justice late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, women should be where all the decisions are being made. So it's not about just getting us to vote in this next election and elections going forward, but it's time to get us to lead. As of January, 2019, women will represent only 24% of members of Congress, 24% of the House and 23% of the Senate and women will hold 28% of seats in state legislators. Women of color represent less than 9% of members of Congress and 2% of governors. And when I win, I will be the first 
black woman governor in the history of our country. In the legal profession, there are 45% of associates, but only 22% of partners and 19% of equity partners. In medicine, we represent 40% of all physicians as surgeons, but only 16% of medical school deans. Women are just 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs, down from a record high of 6% in 2017. But when I tell you these last couple of election cycles, I have seen women organize and mobilize in a way that we never have before. So many women decided that it was time to put their anger and frustration with this country to good use. So they rolled up their proverbial sleeves and got to work. So many women who had never canvassed or phone baked or campaigned before didn't let that stop them. We got in on the ground floor and we affected elections. When we show up, we can win. We can win whether it is us running for office. We can win whether it's supporting great candidates. We can win when we run everywhere from soil and water to sheriff, from school board member to state senate. It doesn't matter. We need women showing up and showing up in big numbers. We are packing lunches and planning launches. We are balancing and doing it all because that's what this time requires. Many people even now are seeing how different our country could, would be if there was actually a woman at the helm. I could tell you that in other countries where women are leaders, there are better outcomes because we negotiate and compromise better. We can multitask better. We are better leaders in general because we listen, we hear, we're deliberate and intentional in what we do and we empathize better than our counterparts. So I know I stand on the shoulder of powerful women who came before me. I stand under trees I didn't plant and drink from wells I did not dig and eat the fruit from the ground I did not tow. But we have to understand that our crowns are bought and paid for. So now it's time for us to wear them the women's suffrage movement, and all of the other movements that happened. It's because of us, it is for us. And now it's time for us to claim what's ours. I'm running for governor because I will be able to set the tone and tenor for who we are as Virginians and what we stand for. And really fight for women and working families everywhere. As delegate, I have carried and championed paid family medical leave. I have passed a bill to end pregnancy discrimination, requiring employers to give us reasonable accommodations so we can pump breast milk, so we can have a seat when necessary. These are common sense things to keep us in a workforce as long as possible. Passed a bill to reduce the black maternal mortality rate, where black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth and postpartum just because of the amount of melanin in our skin and the way that we appear in the world. Also passing a bill to ensure that breast milk is covered by Medicaid. So our babies, if they are born low weight or preterm, they have the necessary food and nutrients that they need to survive. This is what happens. This is what we do when we have women in office, championing affordable health care, championing affordable child care, ensuring that the work-life balance is established, that we have job protections to prop women up, because we are the backbones of our communities and we need to be treated as such. We also make up the, the majority of the, of the essential workers. However, I know so many women that they're being called essential on the front lines, but when they look at their paycheck, it says that they are expendable and that's a problem. And that is exactly why I carried increasing the minimum wage because it will impact women the most. So this is it. Now is our time. It's our time to leave from the front and not the back, to never take no for an answer, to move this Commonwealth and this country forward, but it can only be done if we have women at the helm. I always love that mantra that the best man for a job is actually a woman. So let's go out there. Let's do what needs to get done. Let's fight the good fight and make it so 165 other million women and girls have an opportunity to reach their full possibilities and potential. So thank you all. And I guess I will take this time to answer any questions.
I think if you put them in the chat, then we'll go ahead and read the questions. Jen, I can read them a question out loud to you. Uh, Anna says, when is the time you experienced sex discrimination in the house and how did you overcome it and grow from it? So I experienced sex discrimination in the house um, when I first arrived and it's prevalent, it's every day because oftentimes I'm in room and spaces where I am the only woman that's there. And so I, I'm oftentimes expected to speak for all women because uh, you know we're all monolithic and we think the same thoughts and we all want the same things um, and so it's really challenging because every time I open my mouth I feel like the weight of women everywhere are gently placed on my shoulders and so I have to make sure that what I say and what I do uh, will represent us well and will be effective. So one of the things that I found was that when I'm in the room a lot of times with Republicans and even Democrats, um, I will say something and it will go on as if I hadn't said it. And then a male counterpart will say it or say it in a different way and then it's the greatest idea that anyone has ever shared. Um, and so calling that mansplaining out, I think is really effective and so some women or some people just ignore it. I don't, I call it on its face. And I think whenever we uh, are approached with sex discrimination, whenever we are um, cast aside or not respected or treated professionally, we have to call it out because that's how people will learn and understand and we like, will expose the misogyny. Oftentimes people aren't as conscious of it because it's so prevalent and it happens so much and it's ubiquitous. So um, once you call it out, that's that's what happens. So I'll say, well, thank you, Mike, for saying what I just said uh, an hour ago. And I'll now like to expound on, on my idea about X, Y, and Z. And so you have to, you have to. Sometimes I do it for shock value, but I it, thoroughly enjoy it because one of the things is that VMI has really taught me how to own my power and that you have to lead from the front. You can't be asked, you can't wait your time and your turn. Men never do. And so if we want that respect, if we want to be in those positions of power, we have to show that our backs are strong and our, our, our shoulders are broad and we can carry the weight of whatever's thrown at us. And so I think that is something that uh, happens often um, is the mansplaining and um, the your ideas and what you bring to the table minimized. But as women, we oftentimes have to come to the table better prepared. My grandmother used to always tell me, Jen, you're a woman, so you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And I found that to be true. Whereas men can get away with sometimes being mediocre, that's not an option for us. So we have to be overly prepared. We have to thoroughly review what's going on and what's happening and the issues and the rebuttals and the arguments. Um, and the expectation is perfection. And so it is unfortunate, but I can tell you that I'm looking at the faces of so many of the women that's on this call. And I know that Jordan and Samantha and Molly and Emma and Hannah, I know they're all ready. They're all game and signed up. And so once we start doing these things, it'll make it easier for the people that come behind us. Thank you, delegate. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Christine says, when was the time in which you overcame a hardship and how did that shape you to become a better woman and leader? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think that my life has, uh, you know, 
been so overwhelmed with hardships that it has created a type of grit in me. And sometimes people are just born talented or just, you know, extremely, you know, well-versed or in certain areas. Um, but I think grit goes far, right? Because I've seen a lot of really smart people and I've seen a lot of really talented people, but it's the person who's willing to do what the person next to them isn't willing to do. That's the one who really succeeds. That's the one who makes it through. So I think that grit, I think, for example, just making it out of Petersburg, Virginia, it was hard. It was challenging. Going to schools that were severely underfunded, being taught by unlicensed teachers, um, from in, coming from a community that's plagued with violence and lack of economic opportunity, um, it is really a challenge. And so what it does is that it works that grit muscle right? Because when you're constantly faced with those type of challenges, you have to overcome constantly being told what you can't do, what you won't do. Um, I mean, there were actually teachers in my high school who had a bet that I found out about uh, after the fact that I wouldn't make it out of my first year out of VMI. I mean, who does that? You know, teachers who's supposed to be invested into your success, actually, you know, having bets that you just couldn't even make it out of, you know, your first year at Virginia Military Institute. So it was those type of things that would happen that I would not let deter me from the goal. And I would use that to fuel the fire and the flame of what I needed to do and why I needed to do it. Not just to prove it to myself that I could do it, because I already knew that I could, but for them and for the other people who are watching and who are looking. So I think that that set me on a pace to um, have extreme determination, extreme grit. It's the only way that I was able to make it out of Petersburg. It's the only way I was able to make it out and become one of the first women to ever graduate from Virginia Military Institute. It was the way that I was able to win my delegate race while pregnant with twins, flipping a seat from red to blue. Um, it's the way I became a public defender and a foster mom. And it's what's gonna help me uh, win this race and become the first black woman governor in the history of our country. Because being told no and being denied um, and being told what's possible. Again, my husband always say, Jen, when, people, when will people learn that the worst thing anyone could ever do is tell you that there's something that you can't do, to tell you no right um because it just it does something and it makes me want to move mountains um and walk through fire in order to make it happen so my goal is to you know make wonderful things happen for women across this commonwealth and make life easier for us and beat back a lot of this rhetoric and the war on women that has actually happened i mean I can't tell you how disappointed and angry I am when I hear men down in General Assembly talking about women's access to birth control and how we shouldn't have it any longer. And having to explain to them, you're trying to control how and when we start a family, what we do with our lives is absolutely none of your male business. And so that's why we have to have more I encourage so many women to run for office and support other women running for office because we need to beat back um, what's happening right now and to ensure that we push and move women forward in a real way. Do you have any advice for women going into the workforce? The advice I have for women going into the workforce is find out what moves you. I can tell you uh, to my family's dismay, after I went to law school, I did not go to White Shoe Law Firm and make, you know, 50, 100 million, 11 dollars. I decided to become a public defender. And so a public defender, as my husband liked to say, is I'm a, a, a social worker with a law degree, right? Um, actually, the manager at Walmart makes more money than I do, just to put it into context for people. I represent people 100% uh, below the poverty line. And many of my clients are people with substance abuse and mental illness and children, where their families and parents have failed them, schools have failed them, uh, the system has failed them, and I am all they have. And that's what wakes me up in the morning. When someone's constitutional rights have been violated, that pisses me off, right? And then makes me wanna go out there and fight with everything I have. And I can tell you that while some people, you know, making a lot of money is their goal, my goal is to have a job where I don't feel like it's a job that I don't feel like I'm working. When I passed the bill last session to end pregnancy discrimination, it made everything worth it. Because I think about all the women who were fired because they became pregnant, because they decided to start a family. I think about all the women and the women that I met on the campaign trail who are working 
two jobs, two jobs just to get by and had to hide the fact that they were pregnant or go to the bathroom and sneak to go pump breast milk in a dirty bathroom or in a hallway closet that is unacceptable. And so to be their voice in Richmond and to fight for them and their experiences and their children and their families, I can tell you that, you know, that doesn't feel like work. That doesn't feel like a job. It feels like something I was made to do and I was put here on this earth to do. So I would say find your passion, find your goal, find what moves you and, and wakes you up in the morning. What gets you excited? And I say, go do that because, you know, just getting a paycheck, you know, it gets old. It really does. And doing the same thing over again, it doesn't move you. And so I would say, do what moves you, find your passion and then go do that and do it well. What made you keep persevering to do the impossible? Um, that's a really good question. I think what, what pushes me is, is something that I was pretty much born with. I, I was born defiant, right? Um, I, I just remember at a young age, you know, um, my grandmother always wanting to put me in these pretty, pretty dresses with the little socks, with the ruffles and the Mary Janes, and I hated it. And even at a young age, I was questioning social constructs of gender. And I'm like, why is it I can't be outside running with the boys, right? Why can't I go play football? I don't understand this. Why do I have to watch you cook? I don't want to wash clothes. Like, I just, I just didn't understand these social constructs. And I always pushed against them. And I just remember being in, in school and we had school inclusiveness. And we had children with mental illness or, or, or who are handicapped, they were in classes with us. And I just remember there was this one girl and she was constantly teased by the boys. And they mocked her, they teased her, they would push her. And I remember just one day, just enough was enough. And I stood up to the boys and I pushed them back, right? And um, I, I protected her and I was right there with her because what was happening wasn't right. And I was even more upset that people were watching this happen. This, this girl who could not fight for herself, she could not stand up for herself. And so I did, and of course I got in trouble. And I felt good about it. I, didn't, I felt really good about it. I felt good about the fact that I was give, giving a voice to the voiceless, that I was fighting for someone who could not fight for themselves. And that's who we should be. That's who we are, or that's who we were as a society, and I think we still can be that. So I think it, it's something you're really born with. It's not something I was ever really taught. I think it goes back to my Christian values and principles to house the, the, the homeless and feed the hungry. So when I see someone who can't defend themselves, I just want to defend them. So that's why I became also a public defender. That's why I also became a foster mom, helping people who need it the most, standing up for vulnerable Virginians. Um, that's just who I am and that's what I've always been doing. Someone said that they had previously met you at South County High School during a Black Lives Matter rally. Um, and then she asked, what is the most important piece of advice you want to give to a woman going into politics? Um, the best piece of advice I can give to a woman going into politics is just find a mentor. Find a mentor who can help you navigate politics. Uh, because it's not a very good job, you know, to learn on the job because sometimes you make mistakes and they can be very public mistakes that can be hard to bounce back from. Um, and if you wanna get in politics, find out what's important to you. Not everyone wants to run for office. Support someone who, who wants to run for office and figure out what that looks like and what you can do to be most impactful and effective. But I say, if you have people that you like, reach out to them and, um, you know, like, for me, it's the Katie Porters, it's the Ayanna Presleys, it's, it's those type of people that I see also in this fight for the right reasons and uh, who are doing a good job and being vocal and forceful and, move, and moving things in the right direction. So I say reach out to those people and, um, and find a mentor if you really want to get into politics. I can tell you it's, it's hard, it's sufferable, it's annoying, it's frustrating, um, but I can tell you that it's very rewarding when you're able to make things happen and help millions of people, it is the absolute best job you can have. Um, do you think you pursued things that you may not have because you were told that you couldn't do it? 
No, I don't think so. I think that, um, I don't think I would have went to Virginia Military Institute if my best friend didn't tell me that I couldn't, I would never graduate, that I couldn't do it. I don't think that um, I probably would have maybe even stayed in the race running for delegate because it was hard. It's hard knocking thousands of doors while creating two lives inside of you. And I had really bad morning sickness and really ugly swollen ankles. And I just tell you, it's just, if I ever had an excuse to drop out, that would have been the time, that would have been it. But when I heard, you know, the naysayers and they were just like, you know, it, you can't do this. This cannot be done. Who has ever done this? No one. That's why you can't do it. It's like, okay, I'm definitely all in. Um, so I think that it just, it, it lends itself to helping solidify why I'm doing it and that I'm doing it right and I'm doing it well because I tell you, you know, the haters are going to hate, but they really only come after you when you're doing something really, really good and really, really well. And so I think it just continues to propel me forward. Um, even in this race, running for governor, people say it's never been done, so you can't do it. And again, I say, game on. Uh, being a woman at BMI, how did you navigate men trying to paint you as overly emotional when you're just being passionate about what you care about? I'm asking because I'll be commissioning in the Army at the end of the school year. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Um, so some of the things that, you know, my grandmother still did me was like, you never let anyone see you cry, period. Right. And so that's something I always held with me and something I always try to follow. I'm not saying this is the most healthy thing, but it is important. It's important because when people see sometimes any opening of weakness, especially when it's a woman, when it's a man, it's endearing. When men cry, oh, he cares. He's compassionate. Uh, but when it's a woman, we're emotional. Uh, you know, we are, we can't be trusted. We're volatile. We're all of these things. And so we have to understand and identify these, these stereotypes and things aren't fair, but we have to understand that this is the world that we're operating in and the terms that we're operating under. And so it is difficult. It is difficult. I say that you do have to constantly assert yourself. You do have to constantly have this aura about you where people can trust you because you'll be in a leadership position. And people want to know if I go into war with this person, will she be decisive? Will she fully understand what's happening? Will she be able to lead us and not fall apart? But I think that's true for not only women, but men also. I mean, who wants to follow a weak man into to, to the battlefield? No one. So it's just about understanding that that's the dynamic and what we have to operate under. And you're always under people's eyes and they're always looking for any type of weakness that they can exploit. And as women, we just have to step up to the challenge. Um, in a real way. And I wish I had something else better to tell you, but I'm just, I wanna be as honest and candid as I possibly can be. I've seen women where they've cried on the floor in the General Assembly in the House of Delegates, and they were constantly mocked by men and women, men and women. So I just wanna put that out there. It is, it is difficult. There are double standards. We do have to follow a different set of rules. And that's why we have to put on a mask, a physical, a literal one, and a, a metaphorical one, because we're just operating on a different set of rules. And until women being in positions of power, until women are leading Fortune 500 companies, until we are the rule and no longer the exception, you will still have these type of, you know, misogynistic rules that we have to kind of operate under. Okay, let's see. I think we have time for one more question. Um, what was your experience as a woman in law school? I actually loved law school. I love learning. If I could get paid to go to just go to school and just learn, I would just totally do that. Um, but yeah, I went to law school at Thomas Jefferson Law School in San Diego, California, because it was the only school that would offer me like a full scholarship. Um, and it was great. Like I just lived in flip-flops and shorts. I, you know, studied on the beach. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, natural, typical law school experience. But um, if you have an opportunity to do it, you totally do it. Some of the best friends that I have now are the people that I met in law school. So um, 
it was it was absolutely fantastic and I thrived because it was challenging and um, I knew that it would get me to where I needed to be which is in the courtroom doing what Justice Ginsburg was able to do so one of the things one of the real reasons that solidified uh, me going to law school is I saw Justice Ginsburg I saw the fact that she graduated number one in her law school class in Columbia but there were law firms who wouldn't hire her simply because she was a woman that she couldn't even get you know, a Supreme Court internship, even though she was ridiculously smart because she was female. And she saw that as an opportunity. She translated that hurt pain and that discrimination over to becoming one of the best jurists we've ever had in this country and arguing for women and equality across the board everywhere. And she was most effective as an attorney, taking Supreme Court decision after Supreme Court decision and winning winning against these men by using their arguments against them. And so when I saw that she was able to use the law as a sword to strike back and as a shield to protect marginalized communities and people, I said, that's what I want to do. Sign me up for that. And uh, that's why I knew law school was even more interesting to me because I was on a mission to be able to get my law degree, to be able to stand up for other vulnerable people, just like Justice Ginsburg did. So it was fun, I had a great time. But I don't think anyone else will ever tell you that. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Delegate Foy. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for doing this. Thank you guys for your comments. Um, and if anyone has any other questions or if you ever wanna reach me, you just email me um, at jennifercarolfoy at gmail.com. I'll definitely give you a call or respond. Um, or uh, go to my website at jennifercarroll.org. Uh, but thank you all for having me. I really appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We do have just a quick video to close out the conference. So if you wouldn't mind staying for that, um, I wanted to bring everyone in. So here are your coordinators. <laughs> <laughs> we had a bunch of fun in the DSU today, socially distanced and wearing masks, of course. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Again, we will um, play the video really quickly. So.